Hello there, and welcome to another episode of the Executive Compensation Podcast. Today, we are talking all about long-term performance goal setting, and really excited today to have uh, Andrew McElhern and Mike Meyer from Meridian Compensation Partners joining us today. Uh, thank you both for coming on the show. Thanks. It's a great pleasure. Thanks, Jake. Awesome. So, uh, you know, the, there's a, obviously a lot of trouble and a lot of challenge around performance share goal setting. And so to kick this off, let's start with some of the basics. You know, what is it about setting performance goals for performance shares that is so troublesome? Yeah, thanks, Jake. So this is actually something that is not really a recent phenomena. This is something that companies have struggled with for quite some time. If you think about industries that are very highly uh, or, or quickly evolving, like the technology space or very cyclical type industries, it's always been quite a challenge to be able to project out more than a year in advance. Uh, and in most cases, uh, what, we're, what we're measuring in a long-term incentive plan is up to three years of, of performance. Uh, there, there's several trade-offs uh, and choices that you can make as a company, uh, but no one answer uh, for long-term performance goal setting fits every individual company. I'd add some color here, which is um, one of the reasons this is challenging and always has been is you're talking about, in, for many companies, the single largest component of executive compensation. And so you're putting a lot of faith in the quality of your goal setting by tying it to what for many companies is the, the most important component of executive pay. The irony here is, and it's not lost on us, is um, the three-year uh, performance goal measurement period still is regarded as kind of the industry standard. Um, that's increasingly becoming challenging for many companies, more so than has been the case historically. Uh, ironically, it's not long enough really for uh, a typical investment horizon or really a true performance horizon for many companies. So we're stuck with this thing that um, is probably not really reflective of long-term performance, and yet it's still very challenging and becoming more so for many companies to deal with. And so with that, I mean, there's a lot of you know market trends that are um, kind of eating, leading to this. I mean, I know on a lot of episodes that we've had here, there was a lot of talk about long-term incentives and then 2020 hits and it's just like, how do you, you know, then, and then even since then, it's just been like that, but it's, again, this is not a new phenomenon either. And so, you know, with all these market trends and where everything's going, um, you know, are three-year goals even possible anymore? Uh, another good question. And I'd say, I mean, there's still evidence that says this is the ideal that companies are supposed to shoot for. Um, it continues to be an established market standard, the three-year performance measurement window. Um, there's a fair amount of evidence still that investors prefer it. There's plenty of evidence that the proxy advisory firms uh, prefer at least a three-year measurement period. And it's early days in terms of whether practice is actually going to change permanently or not. Having said that, there's plenty of evidence right now that market trends would support a shift. You alluded to the fact that we just came out of a pandemic, which really was the catalyst for many companies saying, we just cannot uh, think beyond a one-year horizon. And for many companies, even one year was too challenging because of the potential impacts of COVID. And then there have been related changes in the markets generally that have added burden to what was already a burdensome uh, challenge for many companies. Uh, in 2021, we had a lot of difficulty with global supply chain dislocations that made economic forecasting and therefore incentive plan goal setting even more challenging. We have had changes in the way that people define performance and the changing nature of work, which has led us to thinking about dimensions of performance now that aren't exclusively financial. And the measurement task there is uh, made more difficult because if you can't measure it with a number, uh, it becomes even harder to measure things in qualitative terms. And that's where just pure subjective judgments tend to find their way in. Not everybody's comfortable with that. Um, and then of late, we've had to deal with inflation, which after you know going on two decades of relative price stability, trying to contend with inflation and build incentive plan goals spanning a long period of time when we don't know what the impact of inflation will be, exceptionally challenging. So all of these have the potential to be transient, but they're all um, forces that are pushing us away from the traditional three-year measurement period in a performance share plan. 
And I think what I'd like to add there is that, as Andrew mentioned, it does vary quite a bit by metric as well. Um, so just because you're not able to set a three-year performance goal in one area uh, or one measure, uh, it may become easier with a different measure. It may become easier with a different measurement type, right? If you're not setting a long-term absolute financial goal, maybe it's a relative performance goal. Um, so there, there's various um, facets to this to this discussion that we'll get into a bit more later. Yeah, it's fascinating. And uh, just seeing all those different challenges, I mean, uh, just even the inflation point you hit, there's the challenge that inflation poses on business, but also the challenge on the compensation plan that uh, what a dollar is today is not what it's going to buy the same thing that a dollar buys three years from now. And so it's how you're adjusting for how infl inflation will impact business as well as how inflation will impact their compensation. So a lot of a lot of challenges you guys are facing uh, with with all of this. And so, you know, let's say you want to stay aligned with, you know, typical or best practices. Is there a single reference point that's most helpful when establishing long term goals? And, you know, or what are some alternative approaches? Yeah. So historically, Jake, and this is still kind of the starting point, um, you do need to start with the internal budget, right? This is something when you're at the compensation committee level, making these decisions for the performance goals uh, for the upcoming cycle. You do want the CFO involved. Uh, you do want to look at the internal budgets, projections, right? Um, but nowadays, there are so many more reference points that you want to consider as well, um, one of which is investor expectations. Uh, one could be historical performance, whether that be historical performance of just the company or historical performance relative to peers. You know, How do we define success? What is good performance? Is that the median of the peer group? Uh, or is that some historical benchmark that we've set for ourselves? Uh, there's also all sorts of third-party opinions and expectations that we're trying to live up to. Um, that could be in terms of the proxy advisors, or it could be through our investor outreach. We, we realize that certain investors uh, are, are focused on certain metrics uh, or, or certain benchmarks that we're trying to achieve. Yeah, I think, I mean, as long as you, you're staying within the sort of comfort zone of we want to set uh, a three-year performance goal, typically a financial goal. So we need to find some way to look three years into the future. Um, in our job as advisors to compensation committees, principally, we want uh, companies and their boards and committees to be able to understand. So, you know, help us get comfortable with what that goal looks like. And a lot of um, how deep you go on on this really depends on how good the partnership is between the human resources function and the financial planning and analysis function and what your appetite is to do a bunch of complicated analytics. I think if you started with your performance goals at target um, for you know, a traditional performance share plan that had threshold target, maximum performance requirements, start with target and then evaluate the reasonableness of your three-year goal, which can either be done with good scenario testing, and that's typically an FP&A function. Um, consider futures where a bunch of good outcomes happen or maybe a bunch of bad outcomes happen and see what the implications for that on um, the outcomes for whatever metric you're using. See if your goal stands up well against those uh, particular scenarios. And then depending on your appetite to keep doing analysis like that, you could repeat the exercise at threshold and at maximum performance levels. But that you know, let's let's be clear eyed that that's a pretty big burden for any FBN organization to take on. And so not all companies will want to go to that extreme length. And where that leaves you is with uh, sort of the mosaic approach of using a diversified set of analytical tools to try and evaluate reasonableness the same way, be it looking at peer performance, be it looking at the market's expectations. Um, Sort of paradoxically, if you're a company using a financial return metric, you have um, an estimate of your cost of capital, which is a nice natural reference point to use. And so uh, the hope is that you look at your goals through a variety of different perspectives and the conclusions all converge. Of course, where it gets fun is if the conclusions don't converge and different analyses tell you different things. And that's um, that can be an unfortunate byproduct of going through an exercise like this. Yeah, definitely a lot of uh, a lot of challenges and ways to look at it and, and ways to slice the the data and information there and and so you know what about using a relative standard for performance? Uh, what are your guys' thoughts on that approach? 
Yeah, I think we we saw for many years um, companies that used relative, it's usually relative total shareholder return. I'll speak a bit about that in a moment. But for many years, we saw what we thought was a shift away from relative TSR as a core plan component and maybe taking a position as a sort of a subordinate component within a plan as a modifier to goals that were set using you know, traditional three-year forecasting approaches. And then the pandemic happened, and I think that trend sort of reversed itself. I think we'll see more and more companies adopting some kind of relative performance dimension to their plans going forward because they have the memory of how difficult it was to measure performance during the active years of the COVID pandemic. But relative has its own drawbacks. Um, first of all, we're almost always talking about relative total shareholder return. So relative to what? It's usually TSR. Um, you could try relative and then some financial metric, but then you're introducing problems of companies that have organized their financial reports differently. And so you're not necessarily making apples to apples comparisons. And even if you could, the next problem you'll run into is public versus non-public data, or to say it, say it slightly differently, gap versus non-gap data. And if you're using gap data, you're again substituting accounting fictions in some cases for economic realities, which isn't going to feel great as an incentive compensation measurement tool, or you're making estimates and assumptions about whatever your peer companies, whatever relative, com relative standard you're using, peer companies or index companies, um, if you're filling in the blanks for some of those non-GAAP measurements, you have to make assumptions and estimates. Moreover, it's going to take the, those same tired financial planning and analysis people months and months and months to do their calculations, uh, taking what's in the public domain and then making further inferences with that. So that's a big challenge. Uh, and I haven't even gotten to what we always think of as sort of the core challenge with relative performance dimension, which is relative to what? What's the right peer group? Um, many companies will proudly say, we don't really have any peers. And that's very often true. And, but so you have to grapple with that challenge too, of find an acceptable peer group that um, both company management and the board is comfortable enough with using, again, to put a significant fraction of total executive compensation and, and tie it to how well you do against that relative uh, reference point, whatever it might be. Yeah, I think sometimes too, at that point to the what peer group it is that you choose, uh, it often brings up other philosophical questions and discussions that were maybe unintended. Uh, for example, are we trying to be a broad market index uh, for who we're competing with for investor dollars? Or are we trying to com trying to outperform those that we consider our close competitors? Um, it brings up the question of, are we a value company that's very mature in nature and, and not expecting large amounts of, of, of quick, rapid growth? Or are we a growth company uh, where we should be competing against other, other growth companies for investor dollars? Um, so even within uh, that, that tight confine, it starts to bring out other philosophical discussions as well. The other point here is, and again, I think, market practice will probably evolve towards using more relative measurement, but nobody really knows how to go to the office on Monday morning and get more relative TSR. So um, the trade-off that you're adopting if you go that route is you're, you're alleviating the goal setting burden, which is good, but you're substituting a plan that rewards behavior or a plan that has incentive properties to one that really rewards outcomes. It has reward properties, but people in the plan are going to feel somewhat disconnected from their ability to actually make things happen within it and therefore um, improve their own payouts. So probably a trade-off worth making for many companies, but they should be clear-eyed about what they're doing, um, altering the nature of their program from one that is an incentive plan to one that's more like a reward plan. Yeah, so I want to kind of um, step back as well and just kind of zoom out really quick on that like relative standard. And so um, just for anyone out there that is not as familiar with this approach, um, from what I'm hearing you guys say on this, a relative standard would be basically saying, you know, we're going to pick market index, we're going to pick a series of companies, or maybe even like past performance of our own company, and your compensation is relative 
um, to that. And that's kind of how you're choosing your benchmarks for, for compensation, as opposed to saying, we want to see X return or X milestones hit. It's really in kind of a percentage relative to some other measurement. Is that really kind of how you are looking at relative or how that's set up? Yeah. So the, the classic design would be pick a set of companies. It could be a custom built peer group, or it could be the constituents of an index measure performance on some dimension. Usually it's total shareholder return TSR. And at the three, at the end of three years, um, how did we do, how do we rank on whatever that performance criterion is? And so the classic design would be is if we hit the midpoint of the group. So if we had a you know, 21 companies, including us, and we were right at the middle, that would earn us a full payout at target. And then if we outperformed, um, let's say three quarters of the companies, we get a full payout at maximum. If we outperformed only a quarter of the companies, uh, we get a payout at threshold. And if we didn't make it out of the bottom quartile, you get nothing. And so the, the main benefit of doing this is you don't have to take a, a point of view or set an actual goal. You just have to outperform uh, the peers in your, in your peer group or your index um, enough to change your relative ranking. And so that has that, that really does alleviate the goal setting burden it converts it from being a forecasting exercise and really into a compensation philosophy exercise at what level of relative performance within the group do we feel comfortable paying for a full target, full maximum, or a minimal threshold uh, level of payout. Yeah, and Jake, that really kind of brings this full circle back to the beginning of this question where uh, we discussed what is the correct approach, right? Should we be setting internal financial performance metrics or should we be setting a relative uh, performance goal? And the answer is oftentimes both, right? Some combination of the two. Uh, and so when we're discussing these, these different points and challenges, um, there is really no one correct answer. It's usually some combination of many. Yeah, that's interesting though, because that approach, um, I see how that makes a lot of sense for a three-year term because let's say you, you know, we go into some level of uncertainty, similar to a pandemic, it could be anything new um, that it faces there. And now it's how do you navigate compared to all the other companies that are also navigating this change in the world. You know, it's like, yes, all these things happen, but you know, as we know that those are situations where some companies can thrive and others will buckle under those. And so it, it's uh, it's a very interesting, I think, approach to, to help navigate that uncertainty. And the, the problem that I'm sure we'll encounter this a bit more and it's, it's come up with it is nobody really likes relative TSR. I think you can be honest and, and say that. And so you often get, well, what if we keep the relative but we drop the TSR in favor of something else. And that can be done, but as, as mentioned, it's sort of tread with caution. Uh, let's say you're using a relative return on capital type of metric, so a financial return metric. Uh, you need to be very diligent that uh, the companies you choose as peers have organized their balance sheets, their financial reports similarly to you. Because you could have two identical companies, except for example, one of them owns 90% of its balance sheet, one of them owns 50% and rents 40%. And right out of the gate, you're gonna have two different return on capital profiles because of those decisions. And you'll either have to spend a lot of time um, engineering the two balance sheets back to something close to parity, or you accept that that difference is going to exist, giving your company a leg up or, or a hindrance. That's hard to do. So I, I always say I, I love the idea of relative not TSR in theory, uh, but in practice, it can get pretty messy. And so we advise going with a little bit of caution on that piece. So if you're going to go relative, you first need to say, can I stomach relative TSR? Well, that. And so what are some of the other design features to help grapple with this challenge? Yes. Yeah, so we, we mentioned one, you know, in the relative performance area, uh, there's also several other levers that you can start to pull um, to help ease, ease the pain of these, this three-year goal setting process. Uh, one of which would be the performance goal range around the target. Uh, so Andrew alluded to this before, where once you feel comfortable with the target, the historical practice was let's be uniform, let's set threshold at 80% of target and let's set maximum at 120% of target. What you're seeing companies start to do is really evaluate how rigorous that target performance goal is and then adjust the range around that target accordingly. Uh, so you could potentially have a wider entry point uh, if the performance, if the target performance goal is quite rigorous. Uh, maybe you, you give a, a larger tail or entry point into that performance curve. 
and then you could have a steeper slope to maximum if you do feel that performance is, is quite rigorous. Um, once you get above that target performance level, uh, you're really rewarding for that outperformance. Uh, another one that I would mention would be that, that we're seeing become quite common is instead of setting um, a dollar value three years out in the future, potentially set a standard for growth that you're willing to accept as a committee and as a management team. And therefore, you can say, I would like to grow our earnings, our revenue, our profit by X percent per year to get to a three-year dollar value. Um, so those are two of kind of the, the major levers you can start to pull as a committee to help to help ease, ease the pain. Now, if you're in this, if you've got this situation where um, a three-year forecast is just uh, too high a hill to climb, and for whatever reasons, the relative standard you don't think is going to work. And I would not fault companies for disqualifying, uh, giving significant weight to relative performance on the grounds that we just don't have enough peers. So fair enough. What does that leave you with? Um, and you're assuming for the moment you don't go all the way to, well, we'll just set an annual goal in our long-term plan and live with the uh, negative consequences we may get when the external markets react to that. Uh, I'd say probably the most common right now, and we did see this quite a bit during uh, the early stages of the pandemic is wider performance ranges. So, you know, we'll, we'll give ourselves a break on being very precise with our measurement when we set the goals and allow for, you know, some significant deviation from performance at target to still result in a target-ish payout. And there are variations on that themes where you have all sorts of uh, kinked lines in your performance curve. Um, the other one that probably hasn't gotten enough traction yet, but may is uh, if you're the kind of company that can um, set one of those growth factors, this works pretty well with growth oriented um, indicators like earnings and just say, well, we'll set a year one goal. And then the year two goal is 110% of year one. And then year three goal is 110% of year two. So you can actually set your goals in advance without taking a position on what the ultimate number has to be three years out. Um, now, of course, that brings you to, so how do we come up with 110% is the right coefficient to put on those year one goals? So there's still challenge and there's still rigor that you need to try and bring to that um, exercise, but it might be a little bit easier for companies than looking out three years and setting a goal uh, at the end of that three-year period. All right, that's super helpful. Definitely hearing all the different tools and things you can use for different situations there. Um, so the next question is, you know, will annual goals help in a performance share unit plan? Um, will those be heavily scrutinized and what things um, can we do to mitigate risk and scrutiny? I mean, I think the short answer to that question is yes, you can expect considerable scrutiny if you have what's supposed to be a long-term performance share, performance share unit plan that's measuring performance in one year increments. Now, you can certainly find market examples of company that will do something like, here's a one year goal, but um, the shares are earned at the end of that one year period, but they don't actually vest until an additional vesting period has elapsed. And maybe you could say, um, and we'll make it a longer than typical vesting period. So we might say it's a one year goal, but the award doesn't actually vest for five years versus the traditional three. Uh, those examples exist, but companies using that type of design in the current environment, yeah, they'll come in for scrutiny. Um, and in some cases, maybe even scrutiny that extends to uh, affecting a say on pay recommendation and a say on pay vote. Um, one of the ways you can get around that is if you like um, splitting the difference or adding some longer term performance elements to the performance share program. So for example, you might have um, a one-year financial performance goal, uh, but a three-year relative total shareholder return dimension to that goal, either as a modifier or as a component of the, the core performance measurement. So you can at least in an instance like that point at it and say, sure, some of this is earned based on one-year performance, but some is earned based on three-year relative TSR. And with that, um, additional context, uh, you might find external observers give you a somewhat fairer shake on that question. Um, and then as noted earlier, 
another way you could do this is to say it's an updating goal. So we only set one year at a time, but we've set the growth factor at the beginning of the performance period, and it would be self-correcting in that case. So let's say you had a long string of uh, outperformance years every year, 110% of the prior year, sooner or later, you're going to have to return back, come back to earth with a design such as that one. So it'd be self-correcting that has some merits to it as well. Um, and then, you know, the probably the most important thing to do at this juncture is if you're going to use a design that won't um, meet all of the governance standards that exist, that won't satisfy that sort of minimum three-year performance measurement, uh, write down what that looks like ahead of time. Uh, see if you can explain it in ways that make sense. See if the explanation holds up. You can say, well, for these reasons, we can't really set a three-year goal. We've chosen to do one year with the following additional long-term elements to it. Probably the most important piece is uh, write down what your rationale for having a non-standard plan actually looks like. If you're using one-year performance measurement period, explain why you felt it was necessary to go that way and see if that explanation is persuasive. Related to that is um, becoming now sort of table stakes for many companies is regular outreach to major investors on the subject of the executive pay program. So typically this is done or historically this has been done when companies had a say on pay issue. It's becoming more the norm to have a regular dialogue with major investors on the subject of the executive pay program. And if you have that dialogue, then you have a channel to open a conversation that says, here's why we're measuring in shorter performance increments under you know, what is supposed to be our long-term plan and at least explain and get feedback from investors about uh, that plan design and whether they like it or not. Yeah, Jake, I think something else important to remember here is that um, none of these decisions should really be made in a vacuum. Uh, I always tell clients, whether it be when they're telling their story or when they're setting their incentive plan metrics and performance goals, that it should really be viewed holistically, right? So if, if you do feel that you need to set annual goals in the long-term performance plan, how much of your total pay is at risk? Are there other components of the plan that may be challenging, uh, very performance-based, or, or is there a lot of retention built into your plan? What other vehicles are you using to deliver pay? Uh, and, and so I think taking a step back and looking at, at it from that 30,000 foot view oftentimes helps uh, justify and, and helps you balance different perspectives of the plan. One thing I think investors want to see is evidence, if it's not in the performance share plan, that uh, company senior executives are in fact in it for the long haul. So there are other design elements separate and apart from performance measurement and the length of the performance period that you could bring to bear, which would help give investors some comfort on that question. For example, if you had a longer vesting period, I work with a couple of companies that have mandatory deferrals of their performance share units, essentially until an executive leaves the company. So, you know, if that's a time horizon measured in decades, you're effectively saying, um, we're gonna use a shorter measurement period, but we don't monetize a dime from those proceeds until we're ready to step off completely from any role with the company. And that sort of um, long-term focus will give some comfort to investors and make them more likely to be supportive of the program. That's incredible. And so as we wrap up here, you know, if you had a company's going into designing their long-term performance goal setting, if you had to kind of narrow or consolidate some of this down to, you know, you know, one or two just really actionable pieces of advice that you'd give to somebody, you know, what would you say to someone as they're going into their, uh, their long-term performance goal setting? So start with the compensation philosophy first. Do you want to follow the current market norm or not? And that's kind of a binary decision. If the answer is yes, we don't want to stick out too much. We want to stay within the established guardrails. Um, so then it's uh, either get yourself a good financial planning and analysis team together, be prepared to do that mosaic of different perspectives on evaluating the performance goals and um, approach it that way, and or consider whether relative performance is going to work for you in some way, shape or form within your performance year plan. So that's down the path that we're gonna keep it traditional. We're gonna stay within existing market standards and basically adapt as best we can. And probably using relative performance uh, is your best way to go. 
as well as perhaps wider performance curves or the updating growth factor, some of those other design uh, ideas that we've talked about today. If you go down the other path of saying, you know, we really just can't handle the forecasting burden, we're going to use shorter measurement periods, you're back to um, making sure you've got a good explanation as to why. It becomes less of conforming the design to market standards and more uh, being satisfied that your explanation is really good, perhaps pair it with um, you know, some relative performance as well as a wrapper around a shorter than ideal measurement period, at least using current market standards. Yeah, and what I would say is, we mentioned this before as well, start with the target, right? So there's, yeah. there's, there's a goal range that will eventually need to be set, uh, but let's put a stake in the ground with our target and make sure that's correct, and then we can build, build off of that. The way to establish that appropriate target uh, is not just with one reference point, as we alluded to. It's bringing in many reference points to the table so that we can start to triangulate uh, what's best for the company, what's best for the executives, and ultimately what's what's best for the shareholders as well. I should add as sort of a code at this point, we're making an assumption here, which I think is fair, and that is uh, some compensation committees might like to say, well, we'll set our rough target but we'll use some judgment at the end of the performance period and sort of true up or down based on how things actually evolve. And unfortunately, um, under US GAAP, that doesn't work too well. It has all sorts of technical and accounting consequences that come with not being precise with your goals up front. And so unless you're, I suppose that could be a third path where you'd say, we'll live with those technical accounting consequences. But for the most part, it's not a prevalent practice to do so. And so most companies will say, okay, we need to play within the accounting rules as they exist and not as we might wish they are. Therefore, um, the choices between uh, short and long measurement periods, I think our advice generally would be um, don't go down the path of those really complicated technical accounting considerations. At least don't go down that path without being eyes wide open about what you might be getting into. Awesome. This was phenomenal. Well, thank you both again for taking all the time to come on here today. This was a great episode and appreciate you taking the time. Thanks so much. Appreciate it, Jake. Thank you.